Okay. Yeah, you can hear me. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Govdiak. I am a founder and CEO of Security Explorations. Today, I'll give you a quick talk about Java security vulnerabilities, especially those that we have uncovered over the last half of the year. So, what's Security Explorations? That's a security startup company from Poland. We provide services in the area of vulnerability and security research. So, we primarily hunt security bugs and software. Uh, we do some kind of commercial and pro bono security research. Uh, we came to life in the result of my passion to hunting bugs and software. So our ambition is to conduct vendor-free and biased security research. We want to bring this area to a new level. What's the goal of this presentation? So we'll be, I'll be disclosing the details of our security research project. And the uh, main goal of this project was to hunt some bugs in Java C software. So I would like to educate you a little bit about security risks associated with certain Java APIs. I want to show you that breaking Java is both challenging and demanding, and that Java security can be actually quite tricky. So first, some short disclaimer. I'll be talking today about you know, the unpublished techniques, but truly speaking, they, they are you know, they've been found about seven years ago. So in 2005, more than 20 security vulnerabilities were reported to then Sun Microsystems. And these were multiple uh, full sandbox Java compromises. As a courtesy to Sun, they were never published. No information was published about them since then. And this work that I'll be discussing, talking about today, will be primarily uh, extending the work from 2005 with respect to Java SE 7. So I'll be showing you some new vulnerabilities, new exploitation techniques, and new stuff. What's the motivation? So we hunt security bugs and software because you know, this is you know, one of our missions. So uh, we want to increase general, uh, general awareness when it comes to security of software. We want to do some contribution with respect to this area uh, to, to the field. So, Java has been within our interest for more than 10 years. In particular, this, this has been my interest in, when it comes to the, you know, the last decade. So I've been hunting bugs in Java since 2002. So, and today, it's actually hard to ignore Java because you know, when you look at some data at java.com, you will find out that Java runs on an estimate number of 1.1 billion of desktops and that there are more than 900 million of Java downloads per year. So, some statistics with respect to our security project. So this was a pro bono security project. This wasn't a commercial thing. So we delivered all information to different vendors for free. We, we did this work for free. This was the project which, which was conducted for about three months' time. And we were able to find multiple security vulnerabilities and Java SA implementations coming from Oracle, IBM, and Apple. You can see in a table some kind of, you know, brief overview of how many of the issues were reported, how many of full sandbox bypass exploits were actually developed. So in total, there were 50 issues and about 28 full sandbox bypass exploits for, for all the vendors. So before going into more details regarding the attacks, uh, I feel obliged to give you a quick overview of Java security architecture. So you probably know that you are Java folks here, so all of you. So you probably know that Java has been around for about 20 years, so, and it's been designed with a security in mind, so from scratch. So security was a priority. So in Java, we got all, all sorts of security-related features, and this in particular includes you know, access control. We can define you know, what kind of access to data uh, uh, classes can have, and this could be private, protected, public, or default. We have strict type checking in Java. This is a very powerful feature, which means that Java is a type-safe language. You cannot do some kind of you know, unexpected or unsafe typecast in Java, like in C or C++. You got the garbage collection, which is also sort of related to the type safety. So there are no direct operations on memory pointers, no free operation. You got some immutable and safe strings representations to avoid buffer overflow-like vulnerabilities, and you got runtime checks for RIs. So there are multiple components which you know, are in Java Virtual Machine, which make sure that the whole platform and technology is secure. And all of these components you see on this slide are actually relevant in some way to the security of the whole platform, because if you look, at the architecture of the Java Virtual Machine, you can 
with respect to every component, you can ask some specific question, and if there is some, some kind of violation, security-related violation, in each of these components, you can actually uh, turn that violation into a full sandbox bypass. For example, let's think about the garbage collection. So there could be a situation where you can have a, a two different objects of different types which, which could share memory, and this can obviously lead to some kind of, you know, security bypass condition. So there are many such questions, and, and you know, hunting bugs in software is about asking these questions, about, about inventing, creating these sort of questions, verifying them, and sometimes some of them turn out to be actual bugs. So, quick intro to some components. So, bytecode verifier, I'll be talking about some issue in, in that component later. So, that's a primary gatekeeper when it comes to Java Virtual Machine security. This is the component that actually makes sure that you cannot do any type unsafe operation in Java. So this component verifies class file format, it verifies the integrity of the bytecode instruction streams. So it's quite complex because, you know, it needs to follow all the uh, constraints which are specified in a Java virtual machine specification. There are lots of them. So it's quite difficult to implement this component in a, in a secure way. And what's surprising is that, you know, Oracle decided to rewrite the bytecode verifier in version 6 and above, and that's a little bit different implementation, and it's based on an Eva Rose lightweight bytecode verification thesis. So we got also class loaders, which are also very important when it comes to the security of the virtual machine. So these are instances of the class loader, JavaLang class loader class, or its subclass. They provide some kind of, you know, methods, functionality to find classes, to load classes, or to define classes in the virtual machine. And class loaders are also responsible for assigning permissions to classes. So they are quite important. They also, they also resolve some other classes, unknown classes. They act like, you know, dynamic linker in a Unix system. They can also load native libraries. And one very important thing for the, you know, further discussion of security of Java is that the null value of class loader, this is the special value in the virtual machine, it designates a trusted, the bootstrap class loader. So one more important term when it comes to Java security, this, this is the term of namespaces. So when a class loader defines classes, uh, all the classes, classes defined by a given class loader instance, they reside in, in, in the namespace of this class loader. So we can have multiple class loader instances in one virtual machine, which means that we can also have multiple namespaces. So and, you know, there could be some, some situations where classes could be spoofed or there could be some conflicts when it comes to the names of, you know, different classes. So these kind of tricks need to be detected and class loader constraints are, are used for that. And one important thing, uh, I don't know how many of you know that package level based access control, this is not only about the same package name, this is also about the same class loader namespace. So classes are in the same package as long as, 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 they, as they reside in the same package name and, uh, and they need to share the same class or the namespace. So protection domains. So I mentioned that class loaders def can define permissions of arbitrary classes when they are loaded to the, defined in, to the virtual machine. So protection domain, this is some kind of a wrapper which can be used to, as to assign classes with specific, you know, permissions. So protection domain simply embeds a class loader and a permission set for a given class loader, uh, for a given class which is to be defined in a virtual machine. So another special value, null protection domain value, is usually uh, designating a privileged system code when it comes to Java SE. And that's a sample of a protection domain. You can see uh, this is some kind of a, you know, applet code which has been downloaded from 10.0.0.2 uh, website. You can see what kind of permissions are assigned by default to the untrusted uh, Java applet code. And this is basically the uh, pure text dump of a protection domain. It's, it defines the kind of a source location, class loader, and permission for a given class. So permissions. As I said, they denote we know what kind of sens security sensitive operations a Java class can conduct in a virtual machine environment. There is a special value denoting all permissions like root and Unix system. This is all permission permission. And we can have uh, dedicated permissions for specific operations like, you know, for network access, file system access, native library loading, and or any other specific API access like, you know, reflection API. So, What's not so known is that many permissions can be actually easily elevated to the all permission. And I have just 
you know, provided a couple of them. You know, if you, if you can create a class loader or access class and, and SAN package, or if you can set security manager, you can become root in Java like, you know, without any problem. So that's not very known, but I, I think that it should be, I mean, people should be more aware of this. So finally, we got a security manager. I guess all of you are familiar with this kind of you know, component of Java virtual, mach virtual machine. So there is usually one instance of a Java Lang security manager class or its subclass in a system. And this is the, the actual you know, object that verif implements all sorts of checks which verify permissions which are required by a given code to conduct a specific secu security sensitive operation. That's a sample dump of a that the usual you know, convention sec security manager is used in Java. First you obtain a security manager instance and then you invoke a specific check method. So as I mentioned, there is one security manager in the, in the whole environment and its reference is, is stored in one private static field which is called security and that's a field of a Java Lang system class. So when this field is set to null value, this basically means that there is no security in a Java virtual machine environment, so, so any, the code can do anything. I mean, any code executing in such an environment can do anything. And the actual class that, that implements all the control checks in Java SC coming from ORAC, that's a Java security access controller class. And you can see that when it comes to checking any permission, this is the class that, that's actually uh, the functionality of this class which is actually invoked from the wrapping method. So what's also important is the privilege operation, because you know, in Java, some, from time to time, there needs to be a situation where some privileged operation needs to be conducted. So uh, Java model assumes that granted permissions are not in effect till some kind of proper construct is used that enables them. So in Java, this contract has a form of a do privilege method of access controller class. Whenever a code needs to do something, you know, security sensitive, something with requiring, you know, higher privilege, privileges, this is the contract that, that's, you, that, that's used. So when it comes to the arguments of, of this method, the do privilege method, it takes uh, one argument and this is the, the class that implements either privilege action or privilege exception action interface. And this interface only has one method. This is the run method. And privilege operation, whenever it's going to be called, this is actually the, the run method that's going to be called from within Java Virtual Machine that's going to be conducted in elevated privileges as long as the code possesses those privileges. So here you got the sample of a privilege action, the PA class implementing privilege action, and this is uh, basically the code that requests some kind of, you know, property, access to the property. And below you see, you know, how this code can be used in, in a real life class. So, but at the core of the actual Java security model is the so-called stack inspection. So this is basically the mechanism that allows to enable the privileges that have been granted to the classes at the time of loading the classes of the virtual machine. This is also the mechanism that, that's used for verification of the permissions which are held by a given class. So that's actually the core when it comes to the security of Java security model. And this is quite smart security model uh, because the goal of the model is to make sure that it's not possible to actually abuse it uh, by the means of injecting any untrusted code into the path of the privileged code block. So that the block that's, that's invoked inside a do privileged method. So the first implementation of the stack inspection was, was done in Netscape 4.0, that was like, I don't know, 10 years ago, I guess. So unfortunately, the, the, implement, the first implementation was completely broken. So all Netscape browsers could be easily owned. But regardless of that, uh, I still think that it, the idea still deserves some kind of a credit because it's, it's really clever and, and very powerful. So it's not so easy to actually abuse it or break it. So when it comes to the algorithm, so the implementation of this model requires that during runtime, run it's possible to identify the permissions of the class of a given class denoting a given stack frame. So if you got that call stack of classes, you call some methods and some chain. 
So you got the stack frames of those classes. So the, the requirement is that you, you, you are actually able to, that one is actually able to, um, to know what kind of permissions these classes have. And this is actually possible, taking into account that, you know, when, when it comes to defining the class in a virtual machine, each class has associated set of permissions assigned to it, and it's easy to actually grab a pointer to those permissions. So the other, the other special thing about this security model is that there is a special stack frame which denotes a start of the privilege code, and this is the, the this do privileged method, which I mentioned before. So whenever a special operation is going to take place, do privilege is invoked of the access controller class, and this is a special stack frame being asserted onto the call stack. So security manager uh, checks for proper permissions in this security model doing the following thing. So it simply looks at all the stack frames which are being, you know, on the call stack till it finds uh, that all of them have proper permissions, and it stops this look, looking process uh, when, it, this, when there is the, on, the end of the stack, because you, know, we, you can have the end of the stack, or if there is this privileged stack frame which has been asserted by the do privilege call. So this is basically this idea, and you can see here how it works, and this is the, the kind of an, the example that uh, the call stack of uh, privileged operation being attempted by some unprivileged class. So you can see that there are some, you know, trusted system classes on the stack. These are all those java.something. You can see some exploits class. This, this is the, the red bar. So because this class is unprivileged, when security manager, you know, verifies all the permissions of the classes on the stacks, it, it detects that exploit class is unprivileged and there is a security violation being thrown. So this is basically the idea behind, behind the security model because the target permission needs to be granted to all the classes in a, excuse me, in a, in a given scope in order to, to make sure that this privilege can be enabled. So finally, in Java SE, we got package access restrictions. So what this means, it basically means that certain, certain packages are restricted in Java SC. So they contain security sensitive classes like, you know, those implementing reflection deployment or some kind of instrumentation functionality. So the list of restricted packages can be found in Java security file. And uh, you, here you can see a, a sample of those, you know, packages that, that are restricted. Uh, many of those entries have been, you know, included in Java SE in a result of, you know, my research, past research. So finally, I'm slowly going to the core of this presentation. So Reflection API, I guess that most of you are familiar with this. So this is the API, which is implemented by the JavaLang class class and the JavaLang Reflect package. It allows to examine, modify, and runtime behavior of applications which run in a Java virtual machine. So you can obtain class objects, you can examine properties of objects, you can set or get field values, invoke methods, create new instances of objects. So what's not so known about this API is that it actually allows to override the standard Java access control. So there is the implementation uh, has some special private field override. And if that field is set to the true value, security check for a class object, for a field, or, or for a method object is going to be skipped. So, of course, it's not so easy to set this field to the true value, but still, the, the functionality is there, yeah? And the other important thing is that, you know, Ref Reflection API actually provides means for easy breaking of Java type safety. So, because as long as, as you know, an attacker can manipulate the, the Reflection API objects, I mean, like, with if, if, as long as the attacker can play with fields. So attacker can mess up with some values, like, you know, those values denoting, you know, what kind of type this field actually holds. So you can do some kind of tricks. You can, for example, denote that, you know, this field is not actually the object. This field is integer. And if you start, you know, referring to other objects through this field, you will actually uh, land up in some you know, arbitrary memory access. So you, you, you can break the memory safety of Java. You can break type safety and memory safety by using those kind of tricks. So this is also not very known, but I think that people should be aware. This is the reflection API could be used 
to break Java memory safety, and quite easily. So when it comes to the implementation, Reflection API, all of those, the calls, uh, take the value of the immediate caller of an API function, uh, and they simply check this value prior to dispatching a given call. So here you can see that when it comes to the get methods function of the Javalang class, there is a check member access method which takes the value of the caller class loader for some purpose. So this value is taken directly from the call stack. And there is a problem because, you know, if this value denotes a, a, a null value, which, which means that if this is the value assigned to a system class, there is no security check done. Yeah? So, and that's actually the, co the, the cause of some problems because there are many reflection API invocations which are implemented in Java C classes and they all assume that uh, there is a trusted caller by default, that the trusted caller is null, class loader, namespace. So, and it's actually quite risky to assume that this caller is going to be always trusted because, you know, in Java you can play all sorts of tricks. Sometimes you can provide some system code with some, you know, user input which is in a direct form. Sometimes you can provide the input in some indirect form by the means of, you know, all sorts of Java trickery, by the means of some kind of inheritance, overloading, and that kind of stuff. Sometimes you can provide the input through other reflection API calls, like by the means of the method class and its invoke method. So what's the idea? There, there, there is a potential for abuse here, because if, you know, attacker can control the arguments of reflection API calls, which are used by system classes, so attackers can actually try to impersonate the caller, so, which is a system class, and they can sometimes gain access to restricted classes, fields, methods, sometimes to restricted objects, uh, which could be created, and sometimes even restric restricted methods could be invoked. But there is only one requirement. The result of a target API call needs to be available to the attacker in some, you know, in some direct form. What I mean is here, there needs to be some kind of a leak and there cannot be any, any kind of a typecast. So it, it's preferable to have this result in the form of Javalang object class. So that's the idea behind the abuse of Reflection API. So you can imagine an attacker class, some exploit class, applet class, applet class loader namespace. You can have some functionality call calling some vulnerable class in a system namespace. And if this vulnerable class is actually using the Reflection API call, sometimes it might be possible to abuse this call to call some methods of, ja of Javalang class, like for name or get method, and to change the execution flow in such a way so that, you know, attacker can get access to some security sensitive objects, like, for example, some restric restricted classes. And one of those res restricted classes, one of the most dangerous classes, and uh, not only this one, but, but this is one of the most known, I think, is the Sun Misk unsafe class. So how the Reflection API could be abused? So there is actually the class for name method, which takes one argument, the, the string argument, and that's the most desired form, because as long as you can provide the string argument, that if, as long as an attacker can provide the string argument, the attacker is able to actually control the call. There is another form, the class for name, which takes three arguments, which takes the name and the, also the class loader. And the problem here is that this class loader is usually uh, designating the, the current threats class loader, which is usually an unprivileged thing. So, but this can be still abused in some way because sometimes we can force the, this call to have a null argument value, and sometimes we can have this class loader value not to be null, but actually the class loader could be privileged to, for example, load some restricted classes. There are some tricks, like here. This is actually one of the bugs we found. This is bug number 12. You can obtain access to some restrictive objects by the means of, you know, a call to get superclass or get class. You know, in Java, some instances, some object instances are already privileged so, or coming from some restricted packages. So here, calling toolkit, get default toolkit, and then, you know, enumerating uh, the classes of this object, the, the, the superclass of this class, this is going to denote the sun dot 
AWT Sun Toolkit class, which is quite dangerous one because this is what the class that's actually been used by the zero day attack code in uh, August this year. Some other tricks when it comes to abusing reflection API. So we can have, we can get access to, to restricted classes by the means of a get type method of a field object, reflection API field object. So there are some system classes which use instances of system of restricted classes. So one of them are the Java NIO bits, Java util concurrent, atomic, atomic boolean. So both these classes use the object from the, uh, use the unsafe class. And they simply hold a private reference to the sun misc unsafe object instance. So if there is a way to obtain a reference to the field, just, just reference to the field, to the private field, we can easily automatically obtain access to the class as well by calling the get type method. So some other trick, one could use get component type. In the past, some class loader implementations didn't take into account the possibility to actually load classes by the means of using internal virtual machine, virtual machine internal representation of, of classes. So this is not working anymore, but it's, it's still worth to keep in mind that there are some other tricks uh, which, which could be used to abuse reflection API and to get access to restricted classes. So fields can be accessed by the means of calling get field or get fields methods. So, so access to the restricted field might not, might not be actually you know, looking relevant, but actually there are some interesting fields in the Java SC and the whole you know, classes namespace. So some of them are some of them is the navigator field. It provides some feather reflection access, ref reflection API access to some other fields or, or methods or classes. So when it comes to obtaining references to protected fields, we need to use the, the form of get declared field or get declared fields methods because these are the only methods that can be used to obtain access to private or protected fields. And some protected fields can be still accessed, but we need some other we need to combine the field access with some other issue, like for example, with the issue which allows to set the override field of arbitrary field to the true value so that we can override the standard Java access restrictions and set or get field values. So the best condition when it comes to abusing reflection API is to have control over the invoke method of the Java Lang reflect method class. So um, because this basically allows to, ar to call arbitrary methods whichever an attacker wants to call, yeah? So as long as an attacker has control over the arguments of this method, it can call any other method. So there is no security check prior to the invocation for public methods. This is very important. So it's sufficient to actually have access to the, to the given method object in order to be able to use it and to call it. And this, the reason for it is that, you know, there is an assumption, you know, if someone already obtained uh, a reference to the method, it means that an access check already took place, but still, it, it's quite kind of risky assumption. So here is uh, some kind of, that's not published thing, you know, when it comes to the API and the invoke function, and that's actually the declaration of this, this, this function. So we can have, we need, to have a, a target object for virtual method calls, but for static calls, it should be null, right? But you know, it doesn't matter. It can be this, it can be any object instance, it can be null. We can still call static methods with the use of the invoke construct. So in the code, there are, there are many you know, places where there was invoke, but it, it looked as if it was sort of limited to a given class or to a given you know, scope, but actually it could be still abused by, by simply abusing it to call static methods. And that's kind of inconsistency, in our opinion, when it comes to the invoke static bytecode instruction. So invoking methods, uh, there is a, some way to, to still call private methods, and, but we need to override the access to these methods by the means of set accessible function call. Uh, some interesting virtual methods to call, these are obviously those that obtain references to field methods. And interesting static methods calls are of course those that obtain the access to restricted classes, which is like, you know, class for name. 
we can have combination of issues. We, we can combine different reflection API issues. Like, for example, we can, we can obtain access to the given restricted class, and then we can then obtain access to the given constructor to create some instance of a given class, restricted class. We can even abuse the privileged action objects uh, because, you know, these objects, the constructor of these objects takes one, one string argument, and it's still possible to create instances of classes from restricted packages uh, by the means of abusing, you know, just one argument string constructor. There are some calls in the Java C code that could, could be abused for, for this. So, in some circumstances, even pure class new instance call, no argument call, could be abused. And, and we found that this could be abused to, to break the Apple code by the means of, you know, bypassing the security checks which were implemented in the static class initializer. So this was the core API, uh, reflection IP I've been, you know, briefly describing. But we have, of course, new reflection API in Java 7. And this is the kind of API which supports dynamic code execution and scripting. And it's kind of, you know, associated with the new Java Virtual Machine Bytecode instruction that in invoke dynamic. We have, you know, um, new, new types, new classes that support, you know, different invocations. And this is the method handle class, which stands for, you know, it allows to, to, to actually, you know, denote the, 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 the handle to the field or to the method, because this is more gener generic API. We can have method types, which describe, you know, types of, of methods or fields. And, and this, in this new reflection API, all reflective accesses are done with respect to the special lookup object. And that's important because uh, this special lookup object takes into account a color of the method handles lookup function. So again, we have some API call which takes into account a color class of the call. Yeah. So, and we can we also started to think you know whether this is some kind of you know less security by design because uh, method handles do not perform access checks when they are called but rather when they are created so as long as you are able to create a, a method handle call you are actually able to to call a method or access a field and there is no more security checks then so that's a quick comparison of the api uh, i probably will skip that because you know a new API, you need more stuff to code. Yeah, you, you operate on, on method handles, method types, but basically the, the kind of functionality is maintained. So when it comes to the possible abuses, so because this lookup object is quite, you know, quite, you know, very important when it comes to the new reflection API. So as long as the, new, as the lookup object comes from a system class ladder namespace, as long as this is a system class, you know, an attacker can, can actually access uh, some sensitive classes, some restricted classes, with the use of that lookup object. And that's because the actual design and implementation has been done in such a way. So this is the lookup object uh, and on behalf of which all accesses are being done. So if the lookup object is a system class, we can access all other system classes, even from restricted packages, because they share the same class loader namespace. So again, so what one needs to do to actually abuse the new reflection API, one simply needs to create a lookup object with a system class. And the, the best thing to accomplish that is to simply uh, abuse some kind of static method invocation as shown here. As if you have some way to, to abuse static invocation from a system code, we can call uh, the lookup function from the method handles class to create a lookup object. And that lookup object will be privileged because the color will be a system class. So exploitation techniques. And actually, there is one generic approach. So because of the construction and some of the design and implementation of the reflection API, both old, the core and the new one, and we, we can do calls into the system code, some unexpected calls. We can abuse some existing uh, reflection API calls and system code to do some other stuff. So we can load restricted classes. We can obtain references to constructors, method fields. We can actually play with all sorts of, you know, data. But what's the goal? No, actually, the goal is to access security sensitive objects or functionality so that we can compromise the virtual machine's security. And 
there are a couple of scenarios. We, I am going to pr present just two of them. So the first scenario which accomplishes a, a full virtual machine compromise is the one which assumes that there, are, there is a combination of vulnerabilities that allow to obtain references to restricted classes and methods. And the goal is to use that access to define a custom class. And what class is the best to define? The one that will be simply calling a privilege operation, turning security manager off. Uh, and that's actually this kind of class. So if an attacker is able to define a custom class, like this one, helper class, in a null class loader namespace, in a privilege namespace, by calling new instance, do privilege operation will be invoked, and this will be simply the run method of this class, because we can see at this argument over there. And the run argument will simply set se security manager to null, which means game over and no security checks in the virtual machine environment anymore. So that's the first scenario. The goal is to define a class in a privileged class order namespace. The other scenario is basically, you know, try to play with access to the private method objects. Sometimes this kind of access is possible because, uh, you know, some vendors simply allow to set accessible to true and to override the scope, the, the, the access scope of given, you know, methods, fields, or constructor objects. Uh, and these objects could be used in some way. So what, what we've been abusing this uh, by simply turning this scenario into Scenario number one, so we are calling private methods like for name zero or private get public methods in order to, again, define a, 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 a class in a privileged system class or a namespace. So there are some other scenarios. And so when it comes to creating instances of objects, one can think about creating some objects from Sun security action package. There are some open file input stream action, get property action. These are the action objects, privilege action objects. They could be abused by simply providing instances of this, these objects to, to some special method, access controller bar, but the method is, name is do pri privilege with combiner. And this is a special method because it, doesn't, it does assert one extra trusted stack frame into the call stack, which means that we can actually call the privilege methods. So with this, access controller method, all an attacker needs to do is to have a, have a reference to a restricted privilege action object. And s sometimes access to such objects is possible because reflection API can be used to create new instances of objects, uh, especially this includes the objects from the, with the package scope. Most privilege action classes use the package scope, but sometimes, uh, you know, Developer, developers override this scope, for example, to public. And, and there was one instance of such an attack in the past, and I'm not sure if this is going to be visible here. Uh, we've had two classes from the same package. They were sort of visible to each other because they were in the same package and the same class or the namespace. So we can see a proxy lazy value class, which is using lots of reflection API calls, like, like it, it's loading cl a class with the use of class for name, it's uh, obtaining a, a, a constructor and calling that constructor. So the, the proxy lazy value class could be actually abused to create instances of the model privilege action object class. They were in the same package. And it didn't matter that the class was you know, t marked as private because private, when it comes to inner classes, means package scope. Yeah? And the important thing is that the constructor was public. And public means that the call to get constructor could actually obtain a reference to the constructor of, of the model privilege action class. So this is one of the attacks that, you know, it, it, it's worth to keep in mind because some instances of this attack can actually occur uh, in reality. So there are lots of the issues of that sort of type found seven years ago, and at that time some microsystems tried to address them. So they did this by introducing some helper you know, classes, helper methods. So they started to replace, you know, insecure call, potentially insecure call with, with a safe form of that call. So we here see the reflection API calls and replacement of these calls, secure replacement of these calls, which were started to be used in the Java SE code. You'll see, you know, dozens of them as of today and the code, which means that dozens of bugs were fixed by the means of these calls. So the first countermeasure, there is one 
one quite interesting countermeasure because this is the method util class and it's used as a wrapper for the actual refraction API invoke call. How this works? Method util, that's a restricted class and it's actually a class loader. You can see it extends a secure class loader class. That's a class loader. So, and it defines a trampoline class and this trampoline class is defined in the method util class loader namespace. So it's basically, this is kind of, you know, mind twisting trick. We have a class and an object instance which is defined in a separate class loader namespace. So any call to the real method invoke function is going to call for this extra stack frame coming from a different class loader namespace. And what's the goal? Oh, the goal is to simply separate the trusted namespaces, the trusted calls, so that uh, a call for a, a security check for package access is going to actually take place. So it was quite smart, yeah? I admit that some deserves credits here. So there is a countermeasure number two. Uh, I don't know, probably from version six. Uh, there is some kind of filtering mechanism implemented. So uh, internally, when it comes to the Java Lang class, class, and this filtering mechanism prohibits obtaining access to some sen security sensitive fields. And this in particular includes one method of unsafe class. This is get unsafe method. This method could be abused to obtain a reference to a real life working object instance of unsafe class. And of course, security field of the Java Lang system class, which is also very sensitive because it denotes the current instance of a security manager in the system. But this, this second countermeasure has, you know, multiple deficiencies and, and these are some of the reasons because, you know, uh, access to unsafe class or access to the, uh, you know, security field of security manager class, these are not the only ways to abuse to fully compromise the, the security of a given virtual machine. There are many other ex exploit vectors not taken into account. No filtering is implemented for the new reflection API. So this is kind of, you know, kind of, you know, dangerous inconsistency here. And still security manager can be disabled by calling set security manager method. So I'll show you some of the exploitation vectors. These exploitation vectors are about which classes can be actually abused to gain some more privileged access in a virtual machine. So these are the classes from the, pro, pro, from the restricted namespace. So one of the most known is the sun misc unsafe class. So it could be called the official backdoor class with a functionality to break Java memory safety. Why? Because it provides a functionality to to read and to write values to arbitrary memory addresses. It's like, you know, we have a class which we can actually use to read and write memory in Java. Uh, it has also very uh, useful method which can allow, which can be used to define classes or to inject classes in any class loader namespace. So we've been actually abusing this for like the last seven years. So it's, it's still there. And it's probably difficult for Oracle to get rid of because, you know, we know that some big software vendors <laughs> use this class, even though it's kind of, you know, unsafe or in some kind of, you know, restricted package and probably it shouldn't be used. But it, some vendors find it useful. You, they use it in, the, in, the, in their code and it's probably difficult for us to get rid of it. One of the reasons for this. So the other class that could be abused by attackers. So we are talking about abuses by the means of getting reflection access to these classes to to, to getting access to the methods of these classes by the means of getting references to methods. So this, this class could be used in two different ways. And one of these ways was abused in August this year by the zero day code found in the wild. And it had two static methods. And there was a get method method, which provided privileged access to any method in the system. So it was like, whether it was private, we could get access to the method and we could call this method, regardless of whether this was private or not. Uh, same for field access. So this is a Java 7 specific exploit vector. Why? Because in Java 6, these methods were, were having a, a private access. Uh, they were not public, but I don't know why they were made public in Java 7. So this exploit vector was fixed in an out-of-band patch from August 30, 2012. Uh, but still, we can, I mean, Attackers can use the method handles lookup exploit vector. So 
as I mentioned, what, what's required to, to use it is to sim simply be able to call one static method with a trusted caller on the stack. So as, lo as long as we can call this method and, and create a lookup object with a trusted system class, we can get access to members of restricted classes and packages. So and that's due to the, the same class loader namespace, and that's due to the, to the way the members lookup and access is done with respect to the new reflection API in Java 7, because this is the lookup class on behalf of which all accesses are done, not the color of the API class. So this is definitely not noun vector. It's been found a couple of, I don't know, weeks ago, I think, or maybe months. So defining class loader vector, we are, we've been using the some kind of functionality probably developed by Mozilla. So it's a relatively good replacement for the unsafe exploit vector. This is the class that's also exposing uh, a functionality to define arbitrary classes in a privileged class over namespace. And you know, this is what an attacker needs. I want to define a class in a privileged class over namespace. I want to define a privileged system class. And this class will turn all security off. So this class could be abused for that purpose. And but it could be, it needed to be done in two steps. So there are some other exploit vectors which are specific to IBM. So we've been abusing the privilege action object, which was simply providing, you know, some instance to private methods, fields, uh, by the means of setting the accessible value to true by simply overriding access to these fields or methods. So um, yeah, that's IBM specific and it's in the form of a privilege action which could be called with the use of the access controller class and it's do privilege with combiner method. So there are some other exploit vectors. So it's not quite now that RMI protocol could be used to actually launch user provided classes on remote servers. So what's required is actually to have uh, some kind of uh, I'll show it here. What's required is actually to have some kind of property Java RMI server use code base only property set to true. And that's a default for the RMI registry and for the Glassfish server. We've checked a couple of months ago that for those versions here, this still works. So it could be simply abused by you know, establishing a connection with the RMI server, sending proper sequence of, of you know, data according to the RMI protocol, remote method invocation protocol, uh, and, and an attacker could simply send, you know, here is the code base, use this code base as a base for your class loader, RMI class loader, and the RMI server was using that code base that was loading user-provided classes from remote locations, and you know, if those classes were exploiting some vulnerabilities, then you could gain access to remote RMI servers. And we checked those servers still worked. And I'm not sure why this is still working because the issue was found in August 2005. There was some kind of heavy RMI patching in 2011. Also, the, the, the project, Metasploit project, added an exploit code for this issue in 2011. But it still kind of worked. So some other potential potentially remote server-side code execution. This is a, an XML message which breaks Java 7 security sandbox. It's not full, we simply omit some definition of uh, trusted classes here. So, but you know, providing that, that message as an input to the Java Beans XML decoder object instance in Java 7 environment turns the security manager off. So you can imagine if there is some kind of you know, remote server you know, loading some kind of, you know, beans by the means of XML definitions. I don't know if this is a real life scenario. This is just about, you know, to think about it. Yeah, that's a potential. So this could be still abused to, to actually own the remote server. So now backhanding methodology. I'm probably running out of time. Is it seven minutes or more? Anyone can you tell me? This is the time. Okay. So I'll try to be quick. So backhanding methodology, we all do we all the old school manual code analysis. We work with decompiled classes. We don't work with code. Why? Because it's easier for us to simply do pattern matching. So we focus on reflection API. We focus on some use of class loader because you know class loaders can be quite interesting targets. And when it comes to the issues, so these are probably the issues which which 
you know, the exploit codes for one of them was published, I think, two days ago. I received information that there is some code abusing the Glassfish-related packages. So here you can see that there is a method invocation method in a Glassfish-related package, which could be abused to call static methods. There is a this argument for object, but, you know, this doesn't matter much. You can still call static methods. And static methods, what, what kind of static methods you can call? You can call class for name, which is static, or you can call method handles lookup, which is also static and which allows you to create a lookup object with a trusted system class, which is also, you know, kind of game over. So issue number eight. So there are seven issues related to the Glassfish and the insecure use of invoke. Uh, issue number eight, uh, there was a, an issue related to class for name instance, which relied on a thread context class loader. So, but here you can see some kind of, you know, a little bit insecure sequence. Uh, first, there is a privilege call to set a thread context class loader to the uh, privilege loader. Then there is some kind of, you know, functionality done uh, with respect to the uh, user-provided object and the serialization of this object, and then uh, the class loader is being reverted to the original value of the, of the untrusted uh, class loader. So we have a code window, a gap, which could be abused by, uh, by the attacker to simply conduct some operation in this code window, and for example, to, to use the context class loader to, to issue class for name call in particular. Issue number 10, the new bytecode verifier was violating one of the key Java virtual machine constraints. So, uh, you know, instance in initialization method is supposed to actually uh, call a method in the current class, I mean the constructor in the current class or, or, or on, in the super class, but it was possible to call any other constructor. So we could bypass some security checks in class loaders, for example. There are multiple issues related to, you know, finding methods, construct, constructors, and fields, and two of them were abused by the zero-day attack code from August. Uh, they were related to the buggy implementation of the beans decoder introduced to Java 7. I probably skip a, a couple of slides. Uh, issue 32, it's, it's quite interesting. This, was, this one was found quickly after the out-of-band punch was released by, by Oracle. So Oracle blocked one of the exploit vectors, so we tried to see you know, whether some of our remaining bugs are going to work, and we found this issue. So we found a new reflection API issue, and it was about invoking a method from a trusted system class louder con context, which is also a game over, because we could call any other reflection API method in, in that privileged context. So I probably skip those, and yeah, this is interesting. This is still unpatched issue, number 50. So it affects all versions of Java from the last 10 years. We found out that it can be fixed pretty quickly within 30 minutes, only 25 characters in total, no need for integration tests, regardless of what ORAC says. So no response from ORAC uh, when we delivered the results of our experiment to them. So we hope that they would say, you know, we are wrong. It cannot be fixed within 25 characters or that, you know, you have a bug in your code, but they didn't say anything like that for the last month, so we, we just take it as, you know, we were right. So, and also the existence of issue 50 tells a lot about the quality of ORAC's vulnerability evaluation and patch testing processes, because ORAC says we need more time to evaluate, you know, issues uh, more comprehensively. So why, why is this that this bug is in the code, which, been, which has been addressed not so long ago, that simply contradicts what ORAC says? And that's the overview of the vulnerabilities. These are the full sandbox bypass of vulnerabilities affecting only, only Oracle. We needed to combine some of them, but, but each box containing maybe two or three issues, that's a full exploit code, full independent exploit code that's turning off security manager in a Java virtual machine. So there are probably, I don't know, 17 or 16. Still, two issues not patched with the critical issue number 50 not patched. So definitely some, when it comes to security implications of reflection API, one needs to remember that it should be perceived in terms of a security risk and vulnerability nature make it hard to detect because you know, you can call arbitrary methods and do some kind of tricks in response to you know, dynamic functionality reflection API provides. 
So when it comes to the impact, uh, there are lots of full sandbox by bypass exploits, and you know, one of them affecting potentially 1.1 billion users. And there are some vulnerabilities which uh, were potentially affecting remote servers like RMI and XML-based deserialization issues. So it's not only about users of Java plugin used in the web browsers. It's only potentially about the users of servers. So vendors' response. So ORAC fixed 29 of 31 issues, started to act faster when public code was found in the wild, but decided to leave the critical security issue number 50 unpatched till February 2008. 13. Uh, ORAC claims that, you know, we only release security alerts for issues which are publicly disclosed. But ORAC provided us with monthly status update reports. Apple was kind of, you know, well, they had kind of strange approach, you know, silent fix, no credit approach. They were fixing some issues. They didn't provide us with information on the kind of issues they were fixing. Uh, they treated some issues as, as, you know, security hardening issues, not security bugs in their code, which was quite, quite strange. But they decided to remove Java from macOS browsers. And IBM addressed all of the issues. This happened, you know, a couple of days ago. On November 8, they released uh, the new SDK, which simply fixed all 17 issues, and they fulfilled their initial plan to address them in November. So that's also an interesting thing. You know, we've been receiving lots of mails from, also from other vendors. It seems there are some issues between vendors and Oracle, and these are some of the quotes. We're sort of surprised. I don't know how this works when it comes to, you know, security-related, you know, cooperation, but it seems that there are some tensions, and that it seems that some folks have Kind of, some kind of issues here. So, well. Okay, so final words. So, Java, you know, was supposed to be secure by design, but it's, it's not sec necessarily secure when it comes to the implementation because, you know, implementation is actually too complex to, to be sure that it's 100% secure. There are so many components which are responsible for security. Java security can be really tricky. You've got so many elements, you know, one needs to pay attention to. It's like overloading, inheritance, reflection, those stack inspection, class loader, serialization, all of them could be abused to break Java security. So it's extremely tricky to implement something in a secure way. So there are also some design and implementation cho choices which can affect security of a given technology for years. And you know, reflection API is actually one of those samples because if you think about more than 50 security fixes which are related to Reflection API in Java, it actually, you know, speaks for itself. So sometimes small, potentially unimportant security bugs do matter in Java. So we've been receiving mails from vendors. Do we really need to fix this issue that allows to obtain a reference to restricted class? And we were saying, oh, yes, you need to. But they were not sure. Yeah, because they didn't have that kind of understanding that these issues could be combined with some other issues that this could, be, could actually facilitate some, facilitate some other attacks leading to the full sandbox compromise. Finally, not much knowledge about the tricks, techniques used to attack Java is in the field. That's, that's my personal opinion. But in longer term, uh, we believe that publication of vulnerabilities and attack techniques will actually help make Java more secure, because having more people being aware what kind of tricks can be used to abuse Java security will actually help technology, because more bugs will be found before, you know, bad guys do this. And breaking technologies such as Java should focus on advantages specific to the technology. So if someone wants to break Java, don't go after the memory related vulnerabilities first, because this is the wrong way. Focus on the advantages, because there are many other ways Java could be abused to gain reliable code execution, reliable attack. And finally, vendors not following their own secure coding guidelines, not learning from the past mistakes, do not give a bright prospect for the future. And that would be all for me. I apologize for taking a couple of minutes past the designated time. Thank you very much for your attention.